It's great to be here. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, Ron Paul Institute, for hosting. Thank you, Lou Rockwell, for giving me a job at the Mises Institute. Um, I, uh, if, if we're talking about Lou anecdotes, that's great. Um, I remember my first article that I ever wrote along these lines was in December 2000, and it was an article for lourockwell.com. And uh, I was very excited when he agreed to uh, publish that that day. And um, so I just wrote him occasional articles for him for 13 years. And then he asked me to go work at the Mises Institute. So it was a long job interview, it seems. Uh, but it worked out great, at least for me. Uh, hopefully he feels similarly. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit today about seditious conspiracy. Now. Over the past three years, the word sedition has again become popular among regime agents and their friends in the media. It's, uh, it's not the first time the word has been frequently used. Uh, in, in the American context, uh, it's frequently employed whenever the ruling class uh, wishes us to become hysterical about uh, some real and imagined enemy, uh, both domestic and foreign. And this time, the regime's paranoia about sedition was prompted by the Capitol riot on January 6. And when we were told, in, the, in response to that event, that Trump supporters had nearly carried out a coup d'etat, and, and, and since then, the regime operatives have referred to supporters and Trump himself as seditionists. Uh, yet out of the approximately 850 people charged with crimes of various sorts related to the event, a very small number have been charged with anything even close to treason or insurrection. Rather, most of these charges are various forms of infractions related to things like vandalism and trespassing. Uh, because these charges have to do with the regime's sacred office buildings, however, the penalties are outrageously harsh to similar acts where they do occur on private property. For a small handful of defendants, however, the ones the justice is most enthusiastic targeted, the federal prosecutors have brought the charge of seditious conspiracy. Why not charges of treason, rebellion, or insurrection? Well, if federal prosecutors thought they could get a conviction for actual rebellion, insurrection, or treason, they, they would have brought those charges, but they did not. What they did do is turn to seditious conspiracy, which is far easier to prove in court and is, like all conspiracy charges in American law, essentially a thought crime and a speech crime. Seditious conspiracy is not actual sedition or rebellion or insurrection. That is, there is no overt act necessary, nor is it necessary that the alleged, alleged sedition or insurrection actually take place or be executed. What really matters is that two or more people said things that prosecutors would later claim are part of a conspiracy to do something that may or may not ever have happened. Uh, moreover, the regime now routinely employs other types of conspiracy charges for prosecuting Americans supposedly guilty of various crimes against the state. It's a way of, of, of preventing people from speaking out um, very uh, uh, emphatically against the regime, its policies, and also encouraging even non-resistance because that can later be fashioned into prosecutions for conspiracy. Uh, and at the moment, Donald Trump faces three different conspiracy charges for saying that the 2020 election was illegitimate. As we shall see, purported crimes like seditious conspiracy are crimes based largely on things people have said. They are a type of speech crime. Now, some may ask how that is even possible, if there is freedom of speech in this country, and of course, contrary to a na naive reading of the First Amendment, uh, the federal government has never been especially uh, enthusiastic about respecting the right to free speech. The federal government has long sought tools to get around the First Amendment, and one of these is seditious conspiracy. Now, the term seditious conspiracy contains two pieces, right? There's the sedition part, and there's the conspiracy part. So let's look at both parts of this to see what we can learn. First of all, from the very beginning, federal politicians have sought ways to create political crimes above and beyond the Constitution's very limited definition of treason. And that's, that's the role and purpose of sedition in the American context. 
This began with the Sedition Act of 1798 and continued with the creation of the Seditious Conspiracy Law in 1861 and carried on through to the Sedition Act of 1918, the Smith Act of 1940, and a plethora of various types of conspiracy laws used to punish many different types of anti and, uh, anti-war and dissident activities and expression since then. All of these laws involve restrictions on freedom of speech and open up suspects to punishments for saying things. The reason why federal politicians believe they need extra sedition laws on top of treason can be found in the fact that the framers of the Constitution define treason in very specific and limiting terms. So here's the text that they wrote into the Constitution. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them, them as in the states, or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. Note the use of the word only here uh, to specify that the definition of treason shall not be construed as something more broad than what is in the text. And of course, also it notes that this must involve an overt act. And this is all there is in the Constitution in terms of sedition and treason and that sort of thing. And it's very, very limiting. Uh, so, and with, with much of what we find in the Bill of Rights, this language stems from fears that the U.S. federal government would indulge in some of the same abuses that had occurred under the English crown, especially in the days of the Stuart monarchs. Kings had often construed treason, quote unquote, to mean acts, thoughts, alleged conspiracies far beyond the act of actually taking up arms against the state. Treason could have been anything the king didn't like, and that's how you end up with a situation in where, say, St. Thomas More is executed for treason for simply refusing to say that the king was head of the church. So obviously that wouldn't work if you're limiting treason to taking up arms in an overt act. By contrast, in the U.S. Constitution, the only flexibility given to Congress is in determining the punishment for treason. So naturally, those who favored more federal power chafed at these limitations, and they sought more federal laws that would punish alleged crimes against the state. It only took the Federalists 10 years to come up with the Sedition Act, which stated that if any person shall unlawfully combine or conspire together with intent to oppose any measure or measures of the government of the United States, and if any persons or person with intent as aforesaid shall counsel, advise, or attempt to procure any insurrection, riot, unlawful assembly or combination, etc., etc., he shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor. Note the references to intent, counsel, and advise as criminal acts so long as these types of speech are employed in a presumed effort to obstruct government officials. In the 20th century, we will again see this type of language designed to ensnare Americans in so-called crimes of conspiracy. A great many Americans, some of whom still took the radical liberalism of the revolutionary era seriously, saw the Sedition Act for what it was, a blatant assault on the rights of Americans and an attack on freedom of speech. Thanks to the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800, the Sedition Act was allowed to expire. Then for 60 years, the United States government had no laws addressing sedition on the books, but uh, the heart of the 1798 Sedition Act would be revived, as passed in July 1861. The new seditious conspiracy statute stated that if two or more persons within any state or territory of the United States shall conspire together to overthrow or to put down or to destroy by force the government of the United States or to oppose by force the authority of the government of the United States, etc., etc., shall be guilty of a high crime. And note that the crimes here are not overt acts like overthrowing the government or delaying the execution of the law. Those phrases are in there, but the actual crime is the conspiring together. And it's, it's, it's saying things about it to another person. That is, that is what constitutes conspiracy. Now, some people who have a rather benign view of the state might think, well, people shouldn't conspire to do bad things. In real life, however, conspire, uh, conspiracy as prosecuted does not necessarily look like a group of bad guys getting together in a dark room and explaining how they're going to blow up something. Uh, that's normally Hollywood type of stuff. In real life, people can be found guilty of conspiring with people with whom they have never been in the same room or expressed any actual, expressed any actual violent intent. 
uh, and we'll return to this, is this is something to keep in mind whenever looking at any government conspiracy laws at all. Now, given the timing of the seditious conspiracy legislation in 1861, uh, and this was after the secession of several southern states, one might assume that the legislation originated to address Confederate secession, but it had already been in the works uh, before that. The legislation did enjoy considerable support nationwide um, and from people who opposed the Confederacy, uh, but some people who were sympathetic to the Confederacy supported it as well. For example, Cl Clement Vallandigham of Ohio, who was exiled later to the Confederacy for opposing the war. He supported the bill precisely because he thought it could be used against opponents of the fugitive slave laws. And so people who refused to return slaves were, could then be con, uh, convicted of conspiring against federal laws. Uh, and then also, really, the, the, the reason people became really hysterical and thought they needed new sedition legislation was over John Brown's 1859 raid at Harper's Ferry. Uh, they felt something's got to be, do about, be done about those people. And so there was significant support then for ways to crack down on people who are involved in these various types of quote-unquote conspiracies. And uh, this was, uh, this was uh, supported by Senator Stephen Douglas from Illinois, and here's the way he put his support for the bill. Quote, you must punish the conspiracy, the combination with intent to do the act, and then you will suppress it in advance. So this is an early sort of pre-crime. It will be unlawful and illegal to, inv if it be unlawful and illegal to invade a state and to run off fugitive slaves, and here's referring to John Brown, why not make it unlawful to form conspiracies and combinations in the several states with intent to do the act? However, not everybody bought this argument. They thought the country had been fine with just the treason laws in federal law. Uh, Senator Lazarus Powell, for example, and eight other Democrats presented a statement opposing the passage of the bill. Powell and his allies believe the new seditious conspiracy law would be a de facto move in the direction of allowing the federal government to expand the definition of treason beyond what it had been in the Constitution and what even Chief Justice John Marshall had said. All of these things you're trying to convince people on that are less than an overt act don't count as treason. So even the Supreme Court had established a legal tradition of greatly limiting what counted as treason. And in, in Powell's statement, uh, it reads, the creation of an offense resting in intention alone without overt act would render nugatory the provision last quoted. That is the treason definition as stated in the Constitution. The door would then be opened for those similar oppressions and cruelties which under the excitement of political struggles have so often disgraced the past history of the world. Powell is here describing what George L. Orwell would later call a thought crime. This crime, Powell tells us, rests in intention alone, without overt act. To anyone who actually valued freedom in 1861, this would set off major alarm bells. Even worse, Powell saw that the new legislation would provide to the federal government, quote, the utmost latitude to prosecutions founded on personal enmity and political animosity and the suspicions as to intention which they inevitably engender. That is, he was afraid that this would be used as a political tool against people the regime doesn't like, that we can select and choose who's guilty of these conspiracies and that prosecutors would willfully do so. He, of course, has been proven correct. Like so many political crimes invented by regimes, the legislation tends to grant unusual flexibility and discretion in prosecuting the state's perceived enemies. So this opens up political dissidents to new types of prosecution. Now, such legislation could have been used against opponents of the Fugitive Slave Acts. Uh, it became irrelevant after uh, the 13th Amendment, as well as against opponents of federal conscription during the Civil War. Um, and, of course, against opponents, uh, against uh, uh, conscription opponents during later wars as well, especially the Vietnam War. Uh, conspiracy has been used against all of these dissidents over time. It was used sparingly during the Civil War, although Civil War anti-draft activists could have been prosecuted in the sense that they would frequently beat up draft agents sent out to draft people, uh, burn their draft papers, resist in a way that would have been considered uh, extremely um, borderline violent and treasonous by many people, but which mostly went unprosecuted in, those, in that time period because most Americans hated the draft and weren't, probably no jury would have convicted. So 
what we see later is as that conspiracy charges were used against uh, Vietnam War draft card burners like the Catonsville Nine and in trials as well against others. It would be harder to prove in court that such acts constituted treason, so sedition laws have been, have you been used to pave the way far more frequently to prosecuting various acts of resistance. It's bad enough that federal policymakers scheme to insert into federal law new crimes against the state, but as Powell correctly noted, the greater danger is in the part of the sedition law that enables prosecutions for conspiracy. So that's the sedition part of seditious conspiracy, uh, looking at just strictly the conspiracy part. Now, conspiracy laws are not necessarily connected to things like sedition. Uh, they're also used for the war on drugs and lots of other stuff. Uh, current conspiracy law outlaws conspiracy to commit any other federal crime, but it's crime in itself. Uh, and there are, of course, drug laws, there are civil rights violations. All of this you can be convicted in terms of you conspire to do this crime, even if you never actually committed uh, the crime. And as was explicit in the Sedition Act of 1798, it is not necessary that the defendant charged with conspiracy actually harm anyone, that there be any actual victim. Uh, this is a way of charging individuals with crimes that might occur, but have not. Uh, nor is it necessary in, a, in all cases that a conspiracy, a conspirator, take affirmative steps toward completion of the alleged conspiracy. While it is true that some federal conspiracy statutes require at least one conspirator to make some sort of affirmative step, it is also the case that many have no such explicit overt act requirement. Even in those cases where some affirmative act uh, a step could take place. Uh, it is not necessary that that affirmative step be an illegal act. It could be publicly stating an opinion or making a phone call. Uh, all, that has to, all that has to be proven is that it somehow forwarded the conspiracy. And in a 2019 interview with the Mises Institute, Judge Andrew Napolitano highlighted his own problem with conspiracy charges. He says, if it were up to me, there would be no such thing as conspiracy crimes because they are thought crimes and word crimes. But at the present time in our, in our history, and in fact for all of our history, regrettably, an agreement to commit a felony, agreement by two or more people or two or more entities to commit a felony and a step in furtherance of that agreement constitutes an independent crime. In the world of freedom, where you and I and people reading this live, conspiracy is a phony crime. For 600 years of Anglo-American jurisprudence, all accepted that crime contained an element of harm. Today, crime is whatever the government says it is. Napolitano is right. The fact that crime is whatever the government says it is becomes apparent in one of the other key problems with conspiracy laws. Namely, as one legal commentator put it, few things are left so doubtful in the criminal law as the point at which a combination of several persons and a common object becomes illegal. That is, at what point do a bunch of people talking about things become a criminal act? The law is very vague on this, and it is why it is not so easy to say, well, golly, I just won't ever be prosecuted for conspiracy because I don't plan to do anything illegal. But you are not safe. I am not safe because it is not clear in the law at what point statements encouraging legal activities become illegal or statements encouraging legal activities but without real criminal intent become felonies. So you can imagine yourself mouthing off unseriously and saying, we ought to burn down the offices of the Department of Education. And then your friend texts back and says, I agree. Well, congratulations. A prosecutor could easily use that exchange as a way of building a case for conspiracy against you. Would a single expression of an opinion like this be enough to convict? Probably not. But combined with other Unrelated acts and legal activities, such as a stated plan to visit Washington, D.C. soon, or maybe you bought a gun for unrelated purposes, well, a prosecutor could, with enough effort, tie them together in the minds of jurors to get a conviction for a conspiracy. Legislators in the courts have never been able to provide any objective standard for when these disconnected and often legal acts become crimes, and thus prosecutors are afforded enormous leeway in stringing together a series of acts and claiming these constitute a conspiracy. For an indictment, the prosecutor merely need convince a grand jury that legal acts are really part of an illegal conspiracy. This is not difficult, as noted by Judge Solomon Wachtler when he cautioned that district attorneys could convince grand juries to, quote, indict a ham sandwich. Now, 
Not surprisingly, people who are actually concerned about regimes abusing their power have long opposed conspiracy prosecutions in general. For example, Clarence Darrow wrote on conspiracy prosecutions in 1932, concluding, quote, it is a serious reflection on America that this worn out piece of tyranny, this dragnet for, compressing, for com compassing the imprisonment and death of men whom the ruling class does not like, should find a home in our country. Darrow was at least partly joined in this opinion several years earlier by Judge Learned Hand, who in 1925 described conspiracy charges as, quote, that darling of the modern prosecutor's nursery for the way it favors prosecutors over defendants. Conspiracy crimes have been a favorite of government prosecutors in going after political opponents historically. In the wake of the Vietnam War and the federal government's many attempts to prosecute anti-war protesters and activists for various crimes, many legal scholars took a closer look at the nature of conspiracy charges. There's a lot of good legal scholarship on this from the early 70s. Many were skeptical that conspiracy charges are either necessary or beneficial. The elastic and vague nature of conspiracy crimes means that, as legal scholar Thomas Emerson put it, the whole field of conspiracy law is filled with traps for the unwary and opportunities for the repressor. One of the more famous cases of conspiracy prosecutions running amok was the 1968 prosecution and trial of American pediatrician and anti-war activist Benjamin Spock. Spock and four others were charged with conspiring to aid, abet, and counsel draft resistors. That is, they were charged with saying things. Although prosecutors could never show the conspirators committed any illegal acts or were ever even in the same room, Spock and three of his co-conspirators, -co quote unquote, were found guilty in federal court. The case was eventually set aside on appeal, but only on a legal technicality, so the law itself was never, never under threat. Spock was able to avoid prison, but countless others have not been so lucky. Defendants who do not enjoy Spock's level of fame and wealth continue to find themselves locked in cages for saying things federal prosecutors don't like. The legal incoherence of the charges laid against Spock and against anti-war activists in general were covered in detail in Jessica Mitford's 1969 book, The Trial of Dr. Spock, in which she writes, the law of conspiracy is so irrational, its implications so far removed from ordinary human experience or modes of thought, that like the theory of relativity, it escapes just beyond the boundaries of the mind. One can dimly understand it while an expert is explaining it, but minutes later, it is not easy to tell it back. The elusive quality of conspiracy as a legal concept contributes to its deadliness as a prosecutor's tool and compounds the difficulties of defending against it." Unquote. Mitford further draws upon Darrow to illustrate the absurdities of these prosecutions, pointing out that Darrow described conspiracy laws this way. If a boy steals a piece of candy, he is guilty of a misdemeanor. If two boys talk about stealing candy and then do not steal it, they are guilty of conspiracy, a felony. Again, we find that the foundation of conspiracy laws are thoughts and words rather than any actual criminal acts. Or as legal scholar Abraham Goldstein put it in 1959, Conspiracy doctrine comes closest to making a state of mind the occasion for preventive action against those who threaten society, but who have come nowhere near carrying out the threat. The ability to treat this state of mind, quote unquote, as real crimes means, in the words of legal scholar Kevin John Heller, the government currently enjoys substantive and procedural advantages in conspiracy trials that are unparalleled anywhere else in the criminal law. Criminal Conspiracy convictions can be based on circumstantial evidence alone, and the government is allowed to introduce any evidence that, quote, even remotely tends to establish the conspiracy charged, unquote. Now, it's this, this, so this is a very convenient way of quashing dissent against the regime, and the, conspiracy, uh, the, the, uh, the federal government has long used conspiracy laws in this method. Uh, they are a tool against those who protest, and... This is how one legal scholar puts it. Uh, well, actually, all the editors in an unsigned uh, article for the Yale Law Journal put it in 1970. Throughout various periods of xenophobia, chauvinism, and collective paranoia in American history, conspiracy law has been one of the primary governmental tools employed to deter individuals from joining controversial political causes and groups, unquote. Or put another way by the journal, through conspiracy prosecutions, the, quote, government seeks to regulate associations whose primary activity is expression, unquote. 
Naturally, citizens are more reluctant to engage in expressive activities with others that could be characterized in court as some kind of conspiracy. So if you and other members of your gun club like to get a bit over the top, get, get a bit sassy in your comments about the crimes of America's political class, be careful, the, uh, the federal informant in your midst may be taking notes. So it was the case with many government informants placed to investigate groups that opposed the Vietnam War and the draft. Those who simply agreed with radical opinions could find themselves on the wrong end of a federal indictment. Yet any strict interpretation of the First Amendment, which is the correct interpretation, would tell us that this ought to be protected speech under the First Amendment. Federal courts, however, have long disagreed, and some advocates of conspiracy might claim their spe that speech encouraging a specific crime ought not be protected. Yet in real life, conspiracy prosecutions, uh, it, it's not easy to determine whether or not a conspirator, quote-unquote, is actually inciting a crime. As legal scholar David Filveroff notes, the actual intent and effect of the speech in question in these cases is difficult to interpret. Uh, judgments about whether or not speech counts as protected speech in, in the federal judiciary's interpretation, it's highly arbitrary. He writes, with a conspiracy to murder, one faces a potential crime of finite proportion and of near unmistakable content. There is little, if any, risk that either the defendant themselves or the court or jury will mistake the criminality of what the, the defendants propose to do. On the other hand, the probability of such a mistake, both by the alleged conspirators themselves and by the trier of fact, is very high in the case of conspiracy to incite. So back to our case about burning down the Department of Education. Was that casual comment a conspiracy to incite arson? Did the defendant intend it as such? These, this is largely up to the unilateral interpretation of the prosecutor. Most of the time, it is difficult for a conspirator to guess how others will interpret his words and what concrete actions might take place as a result. Under these circumstances, innocent people can end up serving years in prison for expressing their views about what government agents or government institutions ought to do or stop doing. The fact that legal acts can become illegal and the fact that intent need not be proven makes conspiracy crimes, especially seditious conspiracy, an excellent avenue for political prosecutions against perceived enemies of the state. It is not a coincidence that most of the charges against Donald Trump are conspiracy charges. They largely come down to Trump making statements, both public and private, questioning the validity of the election. Prosecutors have turned these opinions into a legal theory that Trump incited others to commit crimes. Thanks to conspiracy laws, it is not necessary that any actual crimes take place or that any actual victims materialize to get a, ver a guilty verdict. Now, of course, thanks to his wealth, Trump has been able to mount a defense, but many other people are not so lucky. Now, these are most dangerous and wielded against political opponents because conspiracy laws essentially nullify the First Amendment and enable prosecutors to turn words into crimes. So what is to be done about this? Well, obviously, conspiracy laws, including seditious conspiracy laws, they ought to be abolished. Um, all sedition laws are especially ripe for repeal, given that the United States survived many decades without any federal political crimes other than treason, very narrowly defined. Yet, if we are to win any meaningful victory against the state, we ought to repeal all political crimes of all types. This includes treason altogether, for one, political crimes like treason and sedition are simply unnecessary. It's already illegal to blow up buildings. It's especially illegal to do it with people inside the building, whether these people are government employees or not. Uh, it is already illegal to murder people, regardless of whether or not they represent the state. Destruction of property is illegal, regardless of whether it's a government building or not. What political crimes like treason and sedition do is create a special class of people and institutions government employees and government property, uh, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we send the message that you get harsher penalties and punishments for opposing these people and institutions, then that does send an important message indeed, and the idea is that uh, killing a government employee is worse than just a mere normal person. Political crimes are often subject to fewer regulations protecting the rights of the accused and are often prosecuted by authorities more directly under the control of the central executive power. In the United States, the federal government has taken over control of most political crimes, centralizing enforcement and thus strengthening the central state. Certainly this has been the case with sedition laws. 
Now, the scam that all modern regimes embrace exists not to keep the public safe. It exists for propagandistic purposes. These laws exist to send a message. They create the illusion that loyalty to the regime, the regime to which one presently pays taxes, is morally important. Or as historian Mark uh, Cornwell puts it, regimes have long used crimes such as these as, quote, a powerful moral instrument for managing allegiance, unquote. Freedom of speech has always been a grave threat to this manipulation of allegiance, and it's why sedition and conspiracy laws have so long been employed to weaponize speech against dissidents. The remedy lies in taking a page from those early Jeffersonians who abolished early sedition laws and refused to create new ones. The regime does not need or deserve a way around the First Amendment. The country does not need these worn out pieces of tyranny that are sedition and conspiracy laws. Abolish them now. Thank you very much.